Now, this next record I want to talk about, Tim. Now, I didn't know this record too well. I, I remember hearing it at the time, a, yeah. a couple of the big videos. I've listened to it properly over this last weekend, and I actually think it's a masterpiece. I say that, and it's not really the kind of music I would listen to normally, but D'Angelo's Voodoo. Mm -hmm. Now, he's a fascinating character. This record was big, sold like... 1.7 million copies, according to Wikipedia. Yeah. Here, because it's one of the few albums I didn't buy on this list as well. Even though it's huge. I didn't buy it at the time, but but I have to say, <clears> listening <throat> to it now, and maybe it's something to do with listening to an album from 2000 in 2024. Yeah. It sounds incredible. So just to give people a little bit of a background to this album, D'Angelo was an artist who'd made one album previous to this, which had been a big R&B soul funk breakthrough record. He took five years making this follow-up record called Voodoo, which, in which he completely reinvented his, his sound. He wanted to get back to a more organic palette. And the big thing about this record is the use of Dilla time. Now, what is Dilla time? Most people are probably asking. Some people maybe know. There was a DJ called Jay Dilla, who I do have some albums by, who experimented with the idea of combining different rhythmic feels simultaneously. And it's something that comes from hip hop, which is where hip hop artists were using break beats from different records. And sometimes those record, those break beats would be overlaid and they would have completely different feels. Sure. So one would be really pushing the beat and another one would be really behind the beat. So what you'd get when you put those two beats together as a DJ would be this natural kind of out of timeness for mm -hmm. want of a better expression. And what happened was there's a lot of live musicians were listening to these hip hop records with these kind of very messy loose out of time grooves and learning how to play yeah so this album the main co-conspirator is quest love who people may know uh he's a documentary maker now he's made that brilliant summer of soul documentary brilliant drummer the rhythm section on this record is quest love and pino paladino the bass mm. player the grooves are incredible because they have these natural loose things you would listen to superficially and say it's all out of time yeah. And one of the anecdotes I love about this record is Lenny Kravitz apparently was booked for a session to come in and play guitar. And he said, I can't play on that. Your drummer can't play. <laughs> and he said, and it's Questlove is the drummer. He said, no, it's deliberate. That's, and he stormed out. He said, I'm not going to play on that shit. Yeah, yeah. Sort it out. Get the, drum, get the drums. Content. And when you listen to this music, it's fascinating because the bass drum and the snare drum and the hi all seem to inhabit a different place yeah. in time and space well you get that i think on the tricky albums you know in the, mm. the 90s where he is overlaying so many rhythms samples that you don't know where it's yeah. you know the music constantly shifting and I, and I listen to it based on you putting it on the list and yeah i think it's really good it sounds fantastic it sort of reminded me of an updated version of Prince is most Very soulful much. and withdrawn. Very much. Prince is the obvious. He's the obvious successor to Prince. Yeah, and and maybe as well. I was thinking Sly, some of the yeah, early seventies Sly and the Family Stone completely, stuff as yeah. well. So when they were making this record, apparently they spent a lot of time listening to "There's a Riot Going On," okay. also to Prince. So you're, you're spot on. Mm. Also, his voice that he he sings in falsetto in a way that Prince, you know, when Prince yeah. sang in falsetto, very similar. But what D'Angelo does is he overlays his voice into these huge blocks, like overdubbing his voice seven or eight times. So you get yeah. these huge blocks of falsetto soul singing. He's a brilliant singer. Mm. Um, it's, it's almost like the first, I mean, I'm no expert at all. I have to say, I'm saying this in ignorance as someone that grew up listening to heavy metal and progressive rock and post post punk. Mm. It seems to me like this might be the first post hip hop attempt at creating live soul and funk music yeah. and of course you do have bands like fuji's just around the corner lauren hill all those other artists coming out doing so so it's this kind of neo soul music which is they're getting back to a more organic palette playing it live mm -hmm. the way sly and prince did but it's post hip hop yeah. so they're playing in a way that is informed by exactly yeah yeah people like Jay Diller who've been experimenting with these loops that shouldn't go together and you get these natural kind of you know strange rhythmic inaccuracies in well the that's a sort of more interesting version I think you know we've both discussed this of how auto-tune on vocals now people sing naturally yes. in an auto-tune yes. style some of them not even realizing what's going on in the record yeah. and i guess it's it's that and whereas i agree with you i think rhythmically it's kind of fascinating 
I'm not so keen on the natural voice attempting the auto tune, you know. No, I'm not either. And just to be clear, that's not on this record, guy. You're talking, yeah. guys. You're talking I'm, about yeah, like the general, exactly. yeah, pop modern. No, pop it was, music I mean, it was really interesting. And I think yeah. what again it made me think of is that you know this D'Angelo album and the Radiohead album. They really sold in an era when things really sold. And, you know, we always talk about this golden era of rock music and pop music as being 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. But actually it bleeds into 2000, the 21st century, where not only are great albums selling in massive quantities, experimental albums are getting to number one. You know, I just because I, I think, again, you know, when I was a kid, I remember we were teenagers when things like ghosts were in the top five, you know, the Japan's ghost was top five and Laurie Anderson, so Superman. And I think of that as a golden time, you know, Gary Newman, our friend's electric, where extraordinary seismic musical shifts were in your top five. But actually, it was still happening in 2000. Kid A, D'Angelo, um, even Tool in the metal world around this time were getting number one records, where music which absolutely reinvented the vocabulary of music is huge. To be fair, as we speak, the smile wall of... Wall of um Wall of Eyes is number three in the album charts, but yeah, they are the anomaly. They are, they the, are anomaly. the anomaly. Yeah, absolutely. And again, we go back to that. That's the kind of magic trick. And they're in the late 50s. That's the magic trick that Tom and Johnny have managed to pull off, you know, which is it's almost like, you know, it's almost like beyond belief how they've managed to do that. Okay. So, I mean, I have to say, I am I was pretty blown away with, with the D'Angelo album. And he's also a very interesting character. He's, he's quite troubled. He's almost got that Scott Walker thing where he disappears mm. for 10 years and then comes back with another record, which will be a, another reinvention. Does he do the Scott Walker go painting and decorating? Does he do that? Well, I don't know. Maybe he goes painting and decorating between albums. That's what you I'd know. do. I'd, you know, maybe become a toilet cleaner for a year or so. So 2000, since he made this album, he's made one further the record <laughs> called Black Messiah in 2013, which Productive. again takes the whole aspect of Dilla time even further, you know, but I think, you know, this album is definitely something if people have not heard it, it's fascinating. If, if you don't like it musically, just listen to the way they're using rhythm on this record. I've never heard anything like it. I'm, well, I say that I have got some Jay Diller albums in my collection, but Jay Diller was a DJ. He was using big break beats. This is a live drummer. And I said to Gavin, I said, is it easy to play? You know, and he says, it's fucking Gavin? hard. Gavin, Gavin, the drummer in my band, Porky Pantry. <laughs> my band, in our band, Porky Pantry. <laughs> in your band, Porky Pantry. I said, I said to him, is it easy to do that, J.D.? And he says, no, it's fucking hard. You know, because you're basically, as a drummer, you're unlearning. Yeah. Everything you've learned to do, you know, play in time. Get the groove in the pocket. No. This is the opposite of that. This is like make everything sort of sound like the shags. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um uh, anyway, absolutely, I was absolutely fascinated by this record. But also, I mean, again, I think it, it, it's tied together because the material's good, his voice is strong, and as you say, those layered vocals sound sumptuous. Yeah, and the production is, is yeah. amazing, yeah. Since I Left You by The Avalanches, this Australian, but kind of, I guess you'd call them a plunder phonics band yeah. in the sense that everything is is made up of, you know, we talked about Jay Diller being a DJ and using only samples to create the music. Here's a band... Also, you know, making music entirely, I think in, almost, is it almost entirely or is it I would, entirely? I would think it might be entirely. Entirely, yeah. entirely constructed from samples. And I think I read on Wikipedia something like three and a half thousand uncleared <laughs> samples on this record. Right. I listened to it. I mean, I'm a big fan of the DJ Shadow record uh, from this time introducing, mm. which also is a, is a plunder phonics. Yeah record entirely constructed this is almost like a slightly dreamier poppier version of that approach in a way to yeah. me it's for me it's closer to the way fat boy slim was you know creating sample based it, music. it's got a feel good on the beach yeah. quality hasn't it i think yeah which meant i kind of it, it, it wasn't I, mean, I like miserable music as you know <laughs> tim and i think you like miserable music too it, it was it's clever it's yeah. nice. It feels a little bit frivolous and, for and me, my we, personal taste. I suppose that the one thing I'd say, you know, in its favour, beyond its massive success, is given it comes from, let's say, 3,000 different sources that it's plundered, it's kind of got its own sound, Absolutely. actually. Absolutely. It does. Yeah. I mean, it's very, very clever. Mm. It's very clever. I wonder if also there's a sense that in 2000 it would have sounded revolutionary and in 2024 yeah. those kind of records just don't anymore. Hey, the two a penny these days, them records, aren't they? Well, I don't know the two a penny, but I think people have stopped making that kind of music in, in a sense because um, 
it's almost so easy now. You just buy you buy some software and you get a bunch of you know loops and you you know you know what I mean. Whereas yeah. at the time it would have been revolutionary. I mean, when Introducing came out, the DJ Shadow record yeah. came out. The fact that he this crate digger was sampling Tangerine Dream, the Monkees, uh, yeah, Pekka Pahola. I mean, mm. you know, this is true crate digging and putting these samples together. Um, I found that really refreshing, but I don't think it would sound refreshing now because it's been done. And also now you've probably got the copyright problem that whereas at that point it also, was kind of it was the Wild West. Now yeah. everyone's after your money, you know. Yeah, that is true. Yeah, people people have cottoned on that yeah. that uh, you can't you can't just sample whatever you like anymore. Heartbreaker by Ryan Adams. This was another record I, over the years people have waxed lyrical to me about. In fact, only a couple of nights ago, I had a friend over for dinner and I mentioned we were going to be talking about this record. And he said to me, oh my God, that was my jam. You know, that, at that yeah. time in my life, Heartbreaker by Ryan Adams. It's alt Americana, isn't it? But it's not as alt as I'd like it to be, is, yeah. is, um, is my line on this. It's very traditional, isn't it? Mm. Very traditional. It sounds great. The production is great. He's a great singer. The, the the songs are really strong, but it's all very very familiar. the The whole musical vocabulary is very very familiar to me. To me, it's not as old as I would need it to be no. to to interest me. It's just me. one of those. You know, you joked last time about Pitchfork albums of the year, and this has just kind of got Mojo album of the year written on yeah. it. And and to me, it just sounded like I don't know. 1960s to early 1970s Dylan most of it with the with the harmonica to the me it was voice, yeah. the chords are so obvious to it's me a, it's Springsteen um, it's, it's uh, yes it's the early Springsteen I, yeah. I don't you know we've talked about this on the show before we both think Springsteen is brilliant but neither of us really like yeah, it so he does it really you know, yeah. don't get me wrong he does it he's really amazing, yes. well yeah. and it sounds great and as you yeah. say he's got the voice he's got the harmonica chops he's got those chords He's got, songs. he's got it all. He's got it all. the looks. Oh, he's got the looks. He's beautiful, yeah. man. But anyway, um, Amy, I thought was interesting. There was one track that was a kind of a yeah, sonic. Amy. It's got a little Mellotron. That was one. Yeah. yeah, again, Mellotron, which is used in a lot of albums this year. But um, that, I thought, okay, God, yeah. if he'd have done an album like that, I'm in. But most of it, I just kind of, I'd been there with Bob Dylan. I'd been there with Neil Young. I'd been there with Bruce Springsteen, and there wasn't that kind of coloration that just woke me up you know whereas when you're listening to the d'angelo even though i've heard the sly and the family stone i've heard the prince he was doing something slightly Never off with it like that. Yeah. exactly yeah you can hear keys into what you know but yeah there are things that you don't know and i guess that was it it just i didn't feel there was anything i didn't know yeah no and that's, I, I'm, not, I'm sorry if that's you know it sounds no cruel, i agree but. i mean listen we're saying a bit like we said with springsteen a bit like we said with dylan um we think it's brilliant Mm. And we can see why people like it. And I don't mean this to sound like I'm damning it with faint yeah. prose. I'm not, I'm not meaning to sound patronising in any way. It's just not my kind of thing. It's brilliant, but to me, it's not alt, it's not alt enough. It, there's not enough in yeah. there that makes me think, oh, you know, wow, that's interesting. Well, I've never the, heard that Exactly. Before. It's like when, I think, you know, something we might discuss, but when Mark Kozalek does the same, because he does, he, he operates in that territory, there are some really unusual chord voicings or that voice which is other or that little lyrical sort of epithet yeah it's like that's um, just so nuts. what we're saying is heartbreaker get off my record deck. i feel like i mean i might be doing a disservice but i feel like having listened to ryan adams album i've heard him talk a lot about with drinking whiskey yeah pontiacs and hanging out with girls in the bleachers which we all did in Warrington. Which we all did in Hemel Hempstead, yeah. 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 It's a very American-sounding record, isn't it? Yeah. So maybe that's partly a reason. That's, that's kind of the reason why Springsteen has never really spoken to Even though I know he's a brilliant lyricist, it's never really spoken to me because I don't recognise that world But then Mitchell about. does it, doesn't he? The Blonde in the Bleachers, and it's poetry. Well, then Taylor Swift is doing it now to me. I think so. some of her lyrics are amazing. They're very American as well. But, um, yeah, Horses for Courses. Anyway... Let's talk about post-rock, slowcore and American indie. We kind of lump them all in together. Yeah, yeah. Because um, they do cross over quite a bit. Obviously, they do. Um, so post-rock's been around for a few years by now. Um, Tortoise seemed like they were the kind of, you know, s standard bearers for, mm -hmm. for post-rock for a while. They released their album called Standards this year, which I thought was quite weak by their standards. But there, mm -hmm. are, some new, there are some new artists kind of coming through. Yeah. Um Godspeed You Black Emperor's big 
epic masterpiece, Lift Your Skinny Fists Like Antennas to Heaven, Mm -hmm. came out this year. Double CD. They kind of got their gag, haven't they? I love their gag. You know, their gag is is kind of um, build up, 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 crescendo, breakdown, ambient, ambient, field recording, field recording, field recording. Build up, build up, build up, build up, build up, build up, crescendo. Ambient bit, ambient bit. Some yeah. violins and cellos with lots of reverb on. Yeah, make it a little bit posher. And it's a great gag and I love yeah. it. And and they kind of explore it from every possible sort of perspective on this one sprawling double album. It's very cinematic. It's it's beautiful. Um, so that for me, this is the kind of masterpiece of of post-rock for, for want of want of a better word what do you feel about this album tim it, to me it was very predictable even from the off i was never blown away by it okay no i think it's really beautiful i mean it listen it doesn't it doesn't sort of captivate me or hold my attention for long periods of time it it does become a bit backgroundy after a mm. while and, and the and the gag does kind of play itself out time and time again this sort of slowly building up crescendo with the sort of ambient sections in between and the use of field recordings i think is yeah. really quite interesting and fresh i mean that's not something i'd heard in any other post rock bands at that, until that point as far as i remember the use of sort of found you know like capturing sort of religious um evangelists mm-hmm. on the street and almost having them in place of a a vocalist you know they become they kind of become the voice of the music don't they those kind of those yeah. monologues i mean i'm being obviously you know i'm playing the devil's advocate on this one being deliberately critical how dare you how but dare i you think criticize? it was just one of those albums that that didn't grab me in the way i felt it should do you, do you feel that way about any of the me. records or you feel they're all I mean, they all pretty much everything I've I've heard. There's kind of there's there's a real formula, and yeah. and it's also more traditional than people think. And again, out of those, other than as you said, maybe the overall combination. Lots of I've heard. You know, I've got the minimalist classical albums. I've got the post rock yes. albums. It doesn't quite. But you know, for me, if I'm listening, thinking of post rock, weird. It's not a post rock band. But I think of the way in which the Swans can go from using one note or a chord lifting 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 explosion so i think that yeah. what they did i'd heard it in a more intense way in other bands so i was thinking you know again it's like i'm going to be blown away by this and i was kind of slightly perplexed mm. because i'd got it already in my collection maybe the way in which they combined elements was the original factor i think they transcend that more than you give them credit for they definitely have their own sound that's sort of very canadian they're from montreal so french canada they have something which is i don't know really what i'm saying here but it seems to me they have something that is very distinctly french canadian about what they do um which which i hear in other music from the same region including all of their their own they're clearly very talented and they've clearly got fantastic record collections and yeah as a collective i think they've put something together that's interesting and once more i think what works for them is it's the combination i think mogwai did this as well very much combination of title artwork music created a world in and, itself and building crescendo but mogwai very good at that yeah. too creating sort of euphoric crescendos from slowly building and again building i and building possibly and building. preferred it in mogwai maybe this is you know i'm unfairly comparing things in a way mm. what else do we have this year we have uh, god i'm sorry no it's okay you're allowed <laughs> tim you're allowed to... I'm not quite sure whether you're god or them but anyway there, there's going to be lots of other stuff coming up that we don't like either <laughs> um We've, we've kind of focused on the stuff we do like so far. Yeah, that's true. Yola Tango, and the, and then nothing turned its, itself inside out. This, yeah. is, I mean, this is an example of a band that have never done anything for me. Uh, critics, darlings. Tastemaker, darlings. Listen to it. It's all right. <laughs> it's all right i mean i for me it's a little more than all right i'm like you know the cover artwork's fantastic the title's great um and there's some lovely pieces you know nice use of primitive drum machines and a few kind of post-rock elements um i like the combination i think i was more excited about it at the time than i am now it was one of those albums that i bought liked re-listened to for the show and it didn't grab me in the way that it did maybe because that vocabulary again like we're saying with godspeed it's been used elsewhere and maybe in a more intense way possibly even by some of the other bands on this list which we'll go through now so uh fevers and mirrors by bright eyes came out this year never heard it 
I've got a few Bright Eyes albums I like. I don't know this one, though, to be fair. Mark Kosalek, our old favourite, released his album of ACDC cover versions um, this year and made it sound like exactly like every other Mark well, Kosalek on, album. Uh, this one has only got three ACDC covers. It's the album after this that he does all the ACDC covers. Oh, beg your pardon. Covers. OK. There are a couple of originals and so on. I, I've got to say, um, I think... The positive about it was it showed you how good the ACDC songs are, and actually that some of the lyrics are really good as right. well. I mean, and I really do like early Bon Scott ACDC. I think are fantastic and underrated band. But um, as much as I love Red underrated, House Painters, that's the first time I've heard anyone say yeah, ACDC, ACDC really DC. underrated. Yeah, what a shame they never sold many records. I know I feel sorry for them. Yeah, you know. What a shame Back in Black didn't do better than it did. I mean, for although me, that's not yeah. Bon Scott and that's not a schoolboy era. Just okay. so happens to be their best selling record. Anyway, <laughs> um, I don't know. It was a Mark Cosler album. I wasn't that impressed. It just seemed no. a bit casual, a bit offhand. No, I think I think this was the beginning of Mark Cosler getting into a groove where where he everything he did sounded like almost a parody of himself. Mm. Uh, with a few exceptions, so there's some records he's made since then I think are beautiful. But he's very prolific, and a lot of his music feels like it's by the yard these days. And this. This felt like it at the time. Felt like a bit of it by the yard, yeah. Eels, Daisies of the Galaxy. I've always found Eels really interesting. Yeah, interesting band. they are one of those bands where there is something vocally, lyrically, texturally. There's an intelligence. There's well, it's a also the, the, the thing with Eels is it's incredibly depressing lyrics with this oh, quite yeah. joyful music. Yeah, it's this almost cognitive dissonance between the music and the lyrics, uh, which I kind of like. It, it works. Yeah. Qu- it works quite well. Um, what's his name? E, isn't it? Is the main yes. guy? Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, Lamb Chop, Lamb Chop released an album called Nixon this year. I used to quite enjoy Lamb Chop. Again, one of those bands I loved at the time, don't listen to as much, but I think they have a real quirkiness, a sweetness. I think he's got such a distinctive voice, uh, voice Kurt Wagner, isn't it? Um, but yeah, incredibly distinctive voice, this kind of American short stories set to music. And it sort of fits this um, kind of singer songwriter Americana post rock nicely. But yeah, they were definitely one of the most distinctive bands in that territory. At the drive-in release, Relationship of Command, which was the last album they they released before they kind of fractalized into Sparta and more significantly perhaps for us, uh, Mars Volta, the Mars Volta. And it kind of gives a little bit of a a hint of what's going to come. Um, Tim, did you want to talk about this? Because I think you you mentioned when you sent me an email, you want to talk about this album by Granddaddy, The Software Ah. Slump. I don't know this record. I thought this is one where I'd just let you talk about it. Well, I'm not really going to say very much about it, but I liked it. You know, it was a strong album. It's still a strong album. It had a bit like, you know, we're talking about the sea song that had that kind of beautiful melancholy anthemic quality on the Doves album they had something on this called the Crystal Lake which has got kind of pulls off a similar trick in that it manages to be rousing anthemic accessible but really quite bittersweet as well I mean my issue it's it's, it's a strong album um but it's maybe too much in awe of Flaming Lips and Mercury Rev. And I know you're not as much of a fan of them as I am. I and mean, I love Flaming Lips and Mercury Rev. This doesn't quite operate on the same level for me. But it's a really good album. And it shows you what happened in the slipstream of the success that, you know, they created a bit of a mini industry going forward in the way that Radiohead did in Britain. And it was very highly rated by the, yeah. the, the usual taste. It was Mojo Album pretty, of the Year. I Mojo think. Album of the Year. Let's talk about a couple of artists. I think we can talk about them together in a way. They're, they are big favourites of mine. Um, Songs Are Higher mm-hmm. and Smog, who are essentially, these are essentially uh, collective identities for individuals. So yeah. Songs Are Higher, Jason Molina and Smog is uh, Bill Callahan. Come from the kind of old folk, old country scene, but I think the one thing they both have in common is they're incredibly dark lyrically incredibly dark bill callahan's smog has more of a black comedy going on in fact there's some lyrics on this album from this year dongs of Savotion is the name of the album which itself is a sort of terrible pun which gives mm. you an idea but he's obsessed with death and black comedy one of the songs on this album is called dress sexy at my funeral mm-hmm. there's a lyric on this album i love without her clothes she looked like a leper in the snow mm-hmm. i mean this is classic bill callahan and at the same time we have Songs are higher releasing an album called Ghost Tropic, which to me is like the spirit of Eden of outsider folk. Yeah. It's a 51 piece of music which seems to be obsessed with the specter of death. It has a haunted, tortured quality to it. 
it is that sense of outsider musicianship. I don't think either of these guys are great singers or great guitar players, mm. but there's something inc with incredible integrity about what they do that seems to be torn from their very being. Maybe I'm imagining this, mm. but the fact that Jason Molina died a few years after this yeah, from yeah. alcoholism tells me a lot um, about about his state of mind when he was so, you know, almost like a sense of exercising something. In, but it's just, the music is reveling in its own misery and melancholy, mm -hmm. isn't it? And of course, the, for that reason alone, I love it, folks. <laughs> that won't surprise you. What did you feel about these? Well, Bill Callahan has got more of a kind of signature voice in the sense he's got character. He reminds me a bit of Johnny Cash, weirdly, who had a mm. great album out this year. Also, Will Oldham is a yeah. strong... Yeah. Um, so I think there's, there's kind of a nice quality to his work and there's there's more obvious irony and humour at play in what he does. Sure. Although it was the songs of higher one out of those that really got me. I thought Ghost Tropic was very beautiful. And, um, as you say, there's one yep. track, I think it's the final piece that's 12 Incantation. minutes. Incantation. With, again, Mellotron, which seems to be yep. an instrument being brought back by everybody this year. But yep. it's it's absolutely gorgeous. And as we, you see, it's kind of, it's almost like this sweet, in a sense, this sweet of misery. Um and I rather like it for that. So, yeah, and he's got, as you say, this kind of... Uh, he's got a more vulnerable... He's close to... He's got the high-pitched, Neil Young, yeah. whiny voice. Bill Callan's got more, as you say, more of the sort of John Johnny Cash baritone sort of register. Yeah. Jason Molina's voice is more the sort of fragile... Neil he's more believably broken. Broken. As I was just going to say, it's almost mm. like it's the voice is on the verge of breaking into yeah. tears at any moment. A bit like you have with some Neil Young, I find. Yeah, right? yeah. Almost on the verge of breaking into tears. But again, he... I don't know what kind of state of mind he when he state of mind he was in when he wrote this. He was an alcoholic. The spectre of death is never far away. No. And there is a sense, I think, unlike with the Bill Call Callahan record, the Smog record, where there's still a sense of the dis discipline of songwriting. Yeah. Here, the songs just ramble, don't they? I think the difference is that Bill Gall Callahan, you can believe in the confidence in his delivery and, and the quality of the songwriting that this is a game. Whereas with the songs of Hayo, this is uh, higher. This is mm. not a game. Mm. This is real life, mm. and I think that's the difference. I think you're right. That's I feel that. I do feel that. I'm sure Bill Callahan writes a lot from from his yeah. own life and stuff. But you're right. I think he has a very wry, acerbic kind of wit. There's always a distance in yeah. a sense. Whereas with Ghost Tropic, you feel like this guy is seriously in need of some counselling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and and. I mean, to me, I, I don't make the Spirit of Eden comparison lightly. It no. almost feels like the Spirit of Eden of of sort of outsider music. It's rambling, it's not obeying any rules, and it feels like it's almost rent from this very tortured place. And it's, more, and it's funny because it's more so than, you know, the stuff I know that we really like, Gastro del Sol and Jim O'Rourke during this period, and they had very open references to things like Spirit of Eden mm. and Robert Wyatt. Um but this is more broken. You know, this is more, again, you kind of feel, and, and I love those Gastrol Sol and, and O'Rourke mm. albums, especially the arrangements, but you can hear the intelligence as they're being made. You can hear the thought processes. Intellect, yeah. Whereas with this, no. you just kind of feel this is straight to tape. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's exactly, in fact, this is one of three albums he released this year. So he's right. making these albums very quickly. And as you say, it sounds like it's just capturing a moment. Again, the Neil Young thing. Yeah. It, it sounds like it's capturing a moment in time. And you know what? It doesn't matter that there are flaws and there are out of tune notes and there are moments when his voice breaks because it adds, it does not detract. It adds to yeah. the, the kind of outsider emotional kick that the well, record this gives is you. it you know because sometimes i come back to this there's certain vocal styles and certain vocalists who can benefit from this so it does not mar the work if anything it enhances it robert wyatt it does that mm. neil young it does that weirdly robert mark wyatt is a very good re very good reference point i think too for this but, record you know Kozlek, he's one of those who i do he, know him do you i know, know him Kozlek? yeah, mark Kozlek, Red yeah i know Panthers. him yeah do you know Little john i do yeah no but anyway mark Kozlek, when he slums it his voice, and I know this was my own, my own voice, isn't this? If I slam it in that way, there are certain voices where if they're slightly off, they sound awful. And so when Kozlek slums it, as he does, I think, on this album, mm. it really does, as you say, by the yard, kind of just sounds wrong. It's mm. like, Mark, go back, re-record that. Mm. And if I do something as well, it's like, go back, re-record it or get Melodyne on it straight away because it's going to kill the listener. But when you've got Neil Young doing this or Jason Molina doing this or Robert Wyatt, 
so natural. Or it Morrissey. sounds right. Or Morrissey. Yeah, yeah. Their out of tuneness is part of their or essential Smith. character. Yeah. Name name your own post punk icon. But there yeah. are there are certain yes. people who don't do Howard Devoto. You know, yeah. Where if they're just ever so slightly out, it doesn't. No, you know, absolutely. Scott Walker. If Scott Walker is off you would notice that yeah. so much it was, yeah. it's not right for the music but yeah so it is fragile it's broken but it really works for it 